The American Civil Rights Movement was a political movement and campaign from 1954 to 1968 in the United States to abolish institutional racial segregation, discrimination, and disenfranchisement throughout the United States. The movement had its origins in the Reconstruction era during the late 19th century, although it made its largest legislative gains in the mid-1960s after years of direct actions and grassroots protests. The social movement's major nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience campaigns eventually secured new protections in federal law for the civil rights of all Americans. After the American Civil War and the subsequent abolition of slavery in the 1860s, the Reconstruction Amendments to the United States Constitution granted emancipation and constitutional rights of citizenship to all African Americans, most of whom had recent, recently been enslaved. For a short period of time, African American men voted and held political office, but they were increasingly deprived of civil rights, often under the so-called Jim Crow laws. And African Americans were subjected to discrimination and sustained violence by white supremacists in the South. Over the following century, various efforts were made by African Americans to secure their legal and civil rights. In 1954, the separate but equal policy, which aided the enforcement of Jim Crow laws, was substantially weakened and eventually dismantled with the United States Courts Brown versus Board of Education ruling, and other subsequent rulings were followed. Between 1955 and 1968, nonviolent mass protests and civil disobedience produced crisis situations and productive dialogues between activists and government authorities. Federal, state, and local governments, businesses, and communities often had to immediately respond to these situations, which highlighted the inequities faced by African Americans across the country. The lynching of Chicago teenager Emmett Till in Mississippi and the outrage generated by seeing how he had, how he had been abused when his mother decided to have an open casket funeral galvanized the African American community nationwide. Forms of protest and or civil disobedience included boycotts, such as the successful Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama, sit-ins such as the Greensboro sit-ins in North Carolina, and successful Nashville sit-ins in Tennessee. Mass marches such as the 1963 Children's Crusade in Birmingham and 1965 Selma to Montgomery marches in Alabama and a wide range of other nonviolent activities and resistance. At the culmination of a legal strategy pursued by African Americans, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954, under the leadership of Earl Warren, struck down many of the laws that have allowed racial segregation and discrimination to be legal in the United States as unconstitutional. The Warren Court made a series of landmark rulings against race discrimination, such as Brown v. Board of Education, Heart of Atlanta Motel versus United States, and Loving versus Virginia, which banned segregation in public schools and public accommodations, and struck down all states banning all laws, state laws banning interracial marriage. The rulings also played a crucial role in bringing an end to segregationist Jim Crow laws prevalent in the southern states. In the 1960s, moderates in the movement worked with the United States Congress to achieve the passage of several significant pieces of federal legislation that overturned discriminatory laws and practices and authorized oversight and enforcement by the federal government. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was upheld by the Supreme Court in Hart of Atlanta Motel, Inc. versus the United States, explicitly banned all discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in employment practices ended on equal application of voter registration, registration requirements and prohibited racial segregation in schools, at the workplace, and in public accommodations. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 restored and protected voter rights for minorities by authorizing federal oversight of registration and elections in areas with historic underrepresentation of minorities as voters. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 banned discrimination in the 
sale or rental of housing. African Americans re-entered politics in the South and young people across the country were inspired to take action. From 1964 through 1970, a wave of inner city riots and protests in black communities dampened support from the white middle class, but increased support from private foundations. The emergence of the black power movement, which lasted from 1965 to 1975, challenge the established black leadership for its cooperative attitude and its constant practice of legalism and nonviolence. Instead, its leaders demanded that in addition to the new laws gained through the nonviolent movement, political and economic self-sufficiency had to be developed in the black community. Support of the black power movement came from African-Americans who had seen little material improvements since the civil rights movement's peak in the mid-1960s, and who still faced discrimination in jobs, housing, education, and politics. Many popular rep representations of the civil rights movement are centered on the charismatic leadership and philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr., who won the 1964 Nobel Peace Prize for combating racial inequality through nonviolent resistance. However, some scholars note that the movement was too diverse to be credited to any particular person, organization, or strategy. Before the American Civil War, eight serving presidents had owned slaves. Almost four million black people remained enslaved in the South. Generally, only white men with property could vote, and the Naturalization Act of 1790 limited U.S. citizenship to whites. Following the Civil War, three constitutional amendments were passed, including the 13th Amendment that ended slavery, 14th Amendment that gave black people citizenship at a near total for conditional apportionment, and the 15th Amendment that gave black males the right to vote. From 1865 to 1877, the United States underwent a turbulent Reconstruction era during which the federal government tried to abolish, to establish free labor and civil rights of freedmen in the South after the end of slavery. Many whites resisted the social changes, leading to the formation of insurgent movements such as the Ku Klux Klan, whose members attacked black and white Republicans in order to maintain white supremacy. In 1871, President Ulysses S. Grant, the U.S. Army, and the U.S. Attorney General Amos T. Ackerman initiated a campaign to repress the KKK under the Enforcement Acts. Some states were reluctant to enforce the federal measures of the act. In addition, by the early 1870s, other white supremacists and insurgent paramilitary groups arose that violently opposed African-American legal equality and suffrage. Intimidating and suppressing black voters and assassinated Republican office holders. However, if the states failed to implement the acts, the laws allowed the federal government to get involved. Many Republican governors were afraid of sending black militia groups to fight the Klan for fear of war. After the disputed election of 1876, which resulted in the end of Reconstruction and the withdrawal of federal troops, whites in the South had gained political control of the region's state legislatures. They continued to intimidate and violently attack blacks before and during elections to suppress their voting. 
that the last African Americans were elected to Congress from the South for disenfranchisement of blacks by states throughout the region. From 1890 to 1908, Southern states passed new constitutions and laws to disenfranchise African Americans and many poor whites by creating barriers to voter registration. Voting rolls were dramatically reduced as blacks and poor whites were forced out of electoral politics. After the landmark Supreme Court case of Smith versus Allwright, which prohibited white primaries, progress was made in increasing black political participation in the Rim South and Acadia, although almost, almost entirely in urban areas. And a few rural localities where most blacks worked outside plantations. The status quo ante of excluded African Americans from the political system lasted in the remainder of the South, especially North Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, until national civil rights legislation was passed in the mid-1960s to provide federal enforcement of constitutional voting rights. For more than 60 years, Blacks in the South were essentially excluded from politics, unable to elect anyone to represent their interest in Congress or local government. Since they could not vote, they could not serve on local juries. During this period, the white-dominated Democratic Party maintained political control of the South, with whites controlling all the seats, representing the total, the total population of the South. They had a powerful voting bloc in Congress. The Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, and the party to which most blacks had belonged, shrank to insignificance except in remote unionist areas of Appalachia and the Ozarks as black voter registration was suppressed. The Republican Lily White movement also gained strength by excluding blacks. Until 1965, the Solid South was a one-party system. Under white Democrats. Accepting the previously noted historic unionist strongholds of the Northern Democratic Party nomination was tantamount to election for state and local office. In 1901, President Theodore Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington, president of the Tuskegee Institute, to dine at the White House, making him the first African-American to attend an official dinner there. The invitation was roundly criticized by Southern politicians and newspapers. Washington persuaded the president to appoint more blacks to federal posts in the South and to try to boost African-American leadership in state Republican organizations. However, those, are just, those these actions were resisted by both white Democrats and white Republicans as an unwanted federal intrusion into state politics. During the same time as African-Americans were being disenfranchised, white Southerners imposed racial segregation by law Violence against blacks increased with numerous lynchings through the turn of the century. The system of de jure state sanctioned racial discrimination and oppression that emerged from the post reconstruction South became known as the Jim Crow system. The United States Supreme Court, made up almost entirely of Northerners, upheld the constitutionality of those states' laws that required racial segregation in public facilities. In its 1896 decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, legitimizing them through the separate but equal doctrine. Segregation, which began with slavery, continued with Jim Crow laws. But signs used to show blacks where they could legally walk, talk, drink, rest, or eat. 
those places that were racially mixed, non-whites had to wait until all white customers were served first. Elected in 1912, President Woodrow Wilson gave in to the mass by summoning members of his cabinet and ordered segregation of workplaces throughout the federal government. The early 20th century is a period often referred to as the Native of American race relations, when the number of lynchings was highest. While tensions and civil rights violations were most intense in the South, social discrimination affected African Americans in other regions as well. At the national level, the Southern Bloc controlled important community committees in Congress, defeated passage of federal laws against lynching, and exercised considerable power beyond the number of whites in the South. Characteristic of the post-reconstruction period, racial segregation by law, public facilities, and government services, such as education, were divided into separate white and colored domains. Characteristically, those for color were underfunded and of, of inferior quality. Disenfranchisement, when white Democrats regained power, they passed laws that made voter suppression more restrict, registration more restrictive, essentially forcing black voters off, of, off the voting rolls. The number of African American voters dropped dramatically. And they were no longer able to elect representatives. In 1890 to 1908, Southern states of the former Confederacy created constitutions with provisions that disenfranchised tens of thousands of African Americans. In US states such as Alabama, disenfranchised poor whites as well. Exploitation increased economic oppression of blacks with the convict lease systems Latinos and Asians, denial of economic opportunities and widespread employment discrimination. Individual police, paramilitary organization and mob racial violence against blacks and Latinos in the Southwest and Asians in the West Coast. African-Americans and other ethnic minorities rejected this regime. They resisted in numerous ways and sought better opportunities through lawsuits New organizations, political redress, labor organizing. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was founded in 1909. It fought to end race discrimination through litigation, education, and lobbying efforts. Its crowning achievement was its legal victory in the Supreme Court decision Brown versus Board of Education, when the Warren Court ruled that segregation of public schools in the U.S. was unconstitutional and by implication overturned a separate but equal doctrine established in Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896. Following the unanimous Supreme Court ruling, many states began to gradually integrate their schools, but some areas of the South resisted by closing public schools altogether. The integration of Southern public libraries followed demonstrations and protests that used techniques seen in other elements of the larger civil rights movement. This included sittings, beatings, and white resistance. For example, in 1963 in the city of Anniston, Alabama, two black ministers were brutally beaten for attempting to integrate the public library. Though there was resistance and violence, the integration of libraries was generally quicker than the integration of other public institutions. The situation for blacks outside the South was somewhat better. In most states, they could vote and have their children educated, though they still faced discrimination in housing and jobs. In 1900, Reverend Matthew Anderson, speaking at the annual Hampton Negro Conference, and Virginia said that the lines along most of the avenues of wage earning are more rigidly drawn in the North than in the South. There seems to be an apparent effort throughout the North, especially in the cities, to debar the colored worker from all the avenues of higher remunerative labor, which makes it more difficult to improve his economic condition 
even that in the South. From 1910 to 1970, blacks sought better lives by migrating north and west of the South, out of the South. A total of nearly 7 million blacks left the South in what was known as the Great Migration, most during and after World War II. So many people migrated from the, that the demographics of some previously black, black majority states changed to a white majority. The rapid influx of blacks altered the demographics of northern and western cities, happening at a period of expanded European, Hispanic, and Asian immigration. It added to social competition and tensions with the new immigrants, battling for a place in jobs and housing. Reflecting social tensions after World War I, as veterans struggled to return to the workforce and labor unions were organizing, the Red Summer of 1919 was marked by hundreds of deaths and higher casualties across the U.S. As a result of white race riots against blacks that took place in more than three dozen cities, such as the Chicago race riot of 1919 and the Omaha race riot of 1919, urban problems such as crime and disease were blamed on the large influx of Southern blacks to cities in the North and West based on stereotypes of rural Southern African Americans. Overall, blacks in northern and western cities experience systemic discrimination in a plethora of aspects of life. With unemployment, economic opportunities for blacks were, were routed to the lowest status and restrictive in potential mobility. With the housing market, strong discriminatory measures were used in correlation to the influx resulting in a mix of targeted violence, restrictive covenants, redlining, and racial steering. The Great Migration resulted in many African Americans becoming urbanized, and they began to realign from the Republican to the Democratic Party, especially because of opportunities under the New Deal of the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration during the Great Depression in the 1930s. Substantially under pressure from African Americans supporters, who began the March on Washington movement, President Roosevelt issued the first federal order banning discrimination and created the Fair Employment Practice Committee. After both world wars, Black veterans of the military pressed for civil rights and often led activist movements. In 1948, President Harry Truman issued Executive Order 9981, which ended segregation in the military. Housing segregation became a nationwide problem following the great migration of black people out of the South. Racial covenants were employed by many real estate developer, developers to protect entire subdivisions with the primary intent to keep white neighborhoods white. 90% of the housing projects built in the years following World War II were racially restricted by such covenants. Cities known for their widespread use of racial covenants included Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, Seattle, and St. Louis. While many whites defended their space with violence, intimidation, or legal tactics toward black people, many other whites migrated to more racially homogenous suburban or exurban regions, a process known as white flight. From the 1930s to the 1960s, the National Association of Real Estate Boards issued guidelines that specify that a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing to a neighborhood a character or property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality or any individual 
his presence would be clearly detrimental to property values in the neighborhood. The result was the development of all black ghettos in the north and west where much housing was older as well as south. The first anti-miscegenation law was passed by the Maryland General Assembly in 1691, criminalizing interracial marriage. In a speech in Charleston, Illinois, in 1858, Abraham Lincoln stated, I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office nor to intermarry with white people. By the late 1800s, 38 U.S. states had anti-miscegenation statutes. By 1924, the ban on interracial marriage was still in force in 29 states. While, inter inter while interracial marriage had been legal in California since 1948, in 1957, actor Sammy Davis Jr. faced a backlash for his involvement with white actress Kim Novak. Davis briefly married a black dancer in 1958 to protect himself from mob violence. In 1958, officers in Virginia entered the home of Richard and Mildred Loving, and dragged them out of bed for living together as an interracial couple on the basis that any white person intermarried with a colored person or vice versa. So each party shall be guilty of a felony and face prison terms of five years. Invigorated by the victory of Brown and frustrated by the lack of immediate practical effect, private citizens increasingly rejected gradualist legalistic approaches as the primary tool to bring about desegregation. They were faced with massive resistance in the South by proponents of racial segregation and voter suppression. And defiant African American activists adopted a combined strategy of direct action, nonviolence resistance, and many events described as civil disobedience, giving rise to the civil rights movement of 1954 to 1968. A Philip Randolph had planned a march on Washington, D.C. in 1941 to support demands for elimination of employment discrimination in defense industries. He called off the march when the Roosevelt administration met the demand by issuing Executive Order 8802, barring racial discrimination and creating an agency to oversee compliance with the order. The strategy of public education, legislative lobbying, and litigation that are typified the civil rights movement in the first half of the 20th century broadened after Brown to a strategy that emphasized direct action, boycotts, sit-ins, freedom rides, marches or walks and similar tactics that relied on mass mobilization, nonviolent resistance, standing in line in the times, civil disobedience, churches, local grassroots organizations, fraternal societies and black owned businesses, mobilized volunteers to participate in broad based actions. This was a more direct and potentially more rapid means of creating change and the traditional approach of mountain core challenges used by the NAACP and others. In 1952, the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, led by T.R.M. Howard, a black surgeon, entrepreneur, and planter, organized a successful boycott of gas stations in Mississippi that refused to provide restrooms for blacks. Through the RCNL, Howard led campaigns to expose brutality by the Mississippi State Highway Patrol and to encourage blacks to make deposits in the black owned Tri State Bank of Nashville, which in turn gave loans to civil rights activists who were victims of a credit squeeze by the white citizens. After Claudette Coleman was arrested for not giving up her seat on the Montgomery. Alabama bus in 1955, March 1955. A bus boycott was considered and rejected, but when Rosa Parks was arrested in December, 
Joanne Gibson Robinson of the Montgomery Women's Political Council, put the Boys Boycott protest in motion. Late that night, she, John Cunning, and others mimeographed and distributed thousands of leaflets calling for a boycott. The eventual success of the boycott made its spokesman, Martin Luther King Jr., a, national, a nationally known figure. It also inspired other bus boycotts, such as the successful Tallahassee, Florida boycott of 1956-57. In 1957, King and Ralph Abernathy, the leaders of the Montgomery Improvement Association, joined with other church leaders who had led similar boycott efforts, such as C.K. Steele of Tallahassee and T.J. Jemison of Baton Rouge and other activists, such as Fred Shuttleworth, Ella Baker, A. Philip Randolph, Baynard Rustin and Stanley Levinson to form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The, C, the SCLC, with its headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, did not attempt to create a network of chapters as the NAACP did. It offered training and leadership assistance for local efforts to fight segregation. The headquarters organization raised funds, mostly from Northern sources to support such campaigns. It made nonviolence both a central tenet and its primary method of confronting racism. In 1959, Septima Clark, Bernice Robinson, and Esau Jenkins, with the help of Mrs. Miles Norton's Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, began the first citizenship schools in South Carolina Sea Islands. They taught literacy to any of the blacks to pass voting tests. The program was an enormous success and tripled the number of black voters on Johns Island. SCLC took over the program and duplicated its results elsewhere. In the spring of 1951, Black students in Virginia protested their unequal status in the state's segregated educational system. Students at Motown High School protested the overcrowded conditions and failing facility. Some local leaders of the NAACP I tried to persuade the students to back down from their protest against Jim Crow laws of school segregation. When the students did not budge, the NAACP joined their battle against school segregation. The NAACP proceeded with five cases challenged in the school systems. These were later combined under what is known today as Brown versus Board of Education. Under the leadership of Walter Ruther, the United Auto Workers donated 75000 to help pay for the NAACP's efforts at the Supreme Court. On May 17, 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court of the Chief Justice Earl Warren ruled unanimously in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, that mandating or even permitting public schools to be segregated by race was unconstitutional. Chief Justice Warren wrote in the court majority opinion that segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon the colored children. The impact is greater when it has the sanction of the law for the policy of separ separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. Lawyers from the NAACP had to gather plausible evidence in order to win the case of Brown v. Board of Education. Their method of addressing the issue of school segregation was to enumerate several arguments. One pertained to having exposure to interracial contact in a school environment. It was argued that interracial contact would in turn help prepare children
to live with the pressures that society exerts in regards to race and thereby afford them a better chance of living in a democracy. In addition, another argument emphasized how educational comprehends how education comprehends the entire process of developing and training the mental, physical, and moral powers and capabilities of human beings. Risa Galibov wrote that the NAACP's intention was to show the course that African American children were the victims of school segregation and their futures were at risk. The court ruled that both Plessy versus Ferguson, which had established a separate but equal death standard in, in general, and Cumming versus Richmond County Board of Education, which had applied that standard of schools, was unconstitutional. The federal government filed a friend of the court brief in the case, urging the justices to consider the effect that segregation had on America's image in the Cold War. Secretary of State Dean Ackerson was quoted in the brief stating that the United States is under constant attack in the foreign press, over the foreign radio, and in such international bodies as the United Nations because of various practices of practices of discrimination in this country. The following year, in the case known as Brown II, the court ordered segregation to be phased out over time with all deliberate speed. Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas did not overturn Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson was segregation in transportation modes. Brown v. Board of Education dealt with segregation in education. Brown v. Board of Education did set in motion the future overturning of separate but equal. On May 18th, 1954, Greensboro, North Carolina became the first city in the South to publicly announce that it would abide by the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board of Education ruling. It is unthinkable remarked School Board Superintendent Benjamin Smith, that we will try to override the laws of the United States. This positive reception for Brown, together with the appointment of African-American David Jones to the school board in 1953, convinced numerous white and black citizens that Greensboro was heading in a progressive direction. Integration in Greensboro occurred rather peacefully compared to the process in Southern states, such as Alabama, Arkansas, and Virginia, where massive resistance was practiced by top officials throughout the states. In Virginia, some counties closed their public schools rather than integrate and many white Christian private schools were founded to accommodate students who used to go to public schools. Even in Greensboro, much local resistance to desegregation continued, and in 1969, the federal government found that the city was not in compliance with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Transition to a fully integrated school system did not begin until 1971. Many northern cities also had de facto segregation policies, which resulted in a vast gulf in educational resources between black and white communities. In Harlem, New York, for example, neither a single new school was built since the turn of the century, nor did a single nursery school exist, even as the second great migration was causing overcrowding. Existing schools tended to be dilapidated staff with inexperienced teachers. Brown helped stimulate activism among New York City parents like May Mallory, who with the support of the NAACP initiated a successful lawsuit against the city and state on Brown's principles. Mallory and thousands of other parents bolstered the pressure of the lawsuit with a school boycott in 1959. During the boycott, some of the first freedom schools of the period were established. The city responded to the campaign by permitting more open transfers to high quality historically white schools. In 
New York's African American community and Northern desegregation activists generally now found themselves contending with the problem of white flight, however. Emmett Till, a 14 year old African American from Chicago, visited his relatives in Money, Mississippi for the summer. He allegedly had an interaction with a white woman, Carolyn Bryant, in a small grocery store that violated the norms of Mississippi culture. And Bryant's husband, Roy, and his half-brother, J.W. Millen, brutally murdered young Emmett Till. They beat and mutilated him before shooting him in the head and sinking his body in the Tallahatchie River. Three days later, Till's body was discovered and retrieved from the river. After Emmett's mother, Mamie Till, came to identify the remains of her son, she decided she wanted to let people see what I have seen. Till's mother then had his body taken back to Chicago, where she had it displayed in an open casket during the funeral services where many thousands of visitors arrived to show their respects. A later publication of an image at the funeral in Jet is credited as a crucial moment as a civil rights movement for displaying in vivid detail the violent racism that was being directed at black people in America. A column for the Atlantic that our new Kirk wrote, the trial of his killers became a pageant illuminating the tyranny of white supremacy. The state of Mississippi tried two defendants, but they were speedily acquitted by an all white jury. Emmett's murder, historian Tim Tyson writes, would never have been a cup of watershed historical moment without Mamie finding a strength to make her private grief public matter. The visceral response to his mother's decision to have an open casket funeral mobilized the black community throughout the US. The murder and resulting trial ended up markedly impacting the, new, the views of several young black activists. Joyce Latner referenced to such activists, the Emmett Till generation. 100 days after Emmett Till's murder, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Parks later informed Till's mother that her decision to stay in her seat was guided by the image she still vividly recalled of Till's brutalized remains. The glass top casket that was used for Till's Chicago funeral was found in the cemetery garage in 2009. Till had been buried in a different casket after being exhumed in 2005. Till's family decided to donate the original casket to the Smithsonian National Museum of African American Culture and History, where it's now on display. In 2007, Brian said that she had fabricated the most sensational part of her story in 1955. Rosa Parks, on December 1st, 1955, Nine months after a 15-year-old student, high school student, Claudette Colvin refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a public bus in Montgomery and was arrested. Rosa Parks did the same thing. Parks soon became a symbol of the resulted Montgomery bus boycott and received the national publicity she was later hailed as the mother of the civil rights movement. Parks was secretary of the Montgomery NAACP chapter and had recently returned from a meeting at the Highland Folk School in Tennessee where nonviolence as a strategy was taught by Miles Horton and others. After the park's arrest, African Americans gathered and organized the Montgomery bus boycott to demand a bus system in which passengers would be treated 
equally. The organization was led by Joanne Robinson, a member of the Women's Political Council who had been waiting for the opportunity to boycott the bus system. Following Rosa Parks' arrest, Joanne Robinson mimeographed 52,500 leaflets calling for a boycott. They were distributed around the city and helped gather the attention of civil rights leaders. After the city rejected many of its suggested reforms, the NAACP led by E.D. Nixon pushed for full desegregation of public buses. With the support of most of Montgomery's 50,000 African Americans, the boycott lasted for 381 days until the local ordinance segregating African Americans and whites of public buses was repealed. 90% of African Americans in Montgomery partook in the boycotts, which reduced bus revenue significantly as they comprised the majority of the riders. This movement also sparked riots leading up to the 1956 Sugar Bowl. In November 1956, the United States Supreme Court upheld a dis district court ruling in the case of Browder versus Gale and ordered Montgomery's buses desegregated in the boycott. Local leaders established the Montgomery Improvement Association to focus their efforts. Martin Luther King Jr. was elected president of this organization. The lengthy protest attracted national attention for him and the city. His eloquent appeals to Christian brotherhood and American idealism created a positive impression of people both inside and outside the South. A crisis erupted in Little Rock, Arkansas, when Governor Arkansas Orville Fabius called out the National Guard on September 4 to prevent entry to the nine African American students who had been sued, who had sued for the right to attend an integrated school. Little Rock Central High School under the guidance of Daisy Bates, the nine students had been chosen to attend Central High because of their excellent grades. On the first day of school, 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford was the only one of the nine students who showed up because she did not receive the phone call about the danger of going to school. A photo was taken of Eckford being harassed by white protesters outside the school, and police had to take her away in a patrol car for her protection. Afterwards, the nine students had to carpool to school and be escorted by military personnel in jeeps. Fabus was not a proclaimed segregationist. The Arkansas Democratic Party, which then controlled politics in the state, put significant pressure on Fabus after he indicated he would investigate bringing Arkansas into compliance with the Brown decision. Faubus then took his stand against integration and against the federal court ruling. Faubus' resistance received the attention of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was determined to enforce the orders of the federal courts. Critics had charged he was lukewarm at best on the goal of the segregation of public schools. But Eisenhower federalized the National Guard in Arkansas and ordered them to return to their barracks. Eisenhower deployed elements of the 101st Airborne Division to Little Rock to protect the students. The students attended high school under harsh conditions. They had to pass through a gauntlet of spitting, jeering whites to arrive at a school on their first day and to put up with harassment from other students for the rest of the year. Although federal troops escorted the students between classes, the students were teased and even attacked by white students when the soldiers were not around. One of the Little Rock Nine, Minnie Jean Brown, 
was suspended for spilling a bowl of chili on the head of a white student who was harassing her in the school lunch line. Later, she was expelled for verbally abusing a white female student. Only Ernest Green of the Little Rotten Nine graduated from Central High School. After the 1957-58 school year was over, Little Rock closed its public school system completely rather than continue to integrate. Other school systems across the South followed suit. During the time considered to be the African-American civil rights ever, the predominant use of protests was nonviolent or peaceful. Often referred to as pacifism, the method of nonviolence is considered to be an attempt to impact society positively. Although acts of racial discrimination have occurred historically throughout the United States, perhaps the most violent regions have been in the former Confederate States. During the 1950s and 1960s, the nonviolent protesting of the civil rights movement caused definite tension, which gained national attention. In order to prepare for protests physically and psychologically, demonstrators received training in nonviolence. According to former civil rights activist Bruce Hatford, there are two main branches of nonviolence training. There is a philosophical method, which involves understanding the method of nonviolence and why it is considered useful. And there is a tactical method, which ultimately teaches demonstrators how to be a protester, how to sit in, how to picket, how to defend yourself against attack, given training on how to remain cool when people are screaming racial, racist insults into your face and pouring stuff on you and hitting you. The philosophical method of nonviolence in the American civil rights movement was largely inspired by Mahatma Gandhi's non-cooperation policies during his involvement in the Indian independence movement, which were intended to gain attention so that the public would, in, would either intervene in advance or provide public pressure and support of the action to be taken. As Hartford explains, philosophical nonviolence training aims to shape individual person's attitude and mental response to crisis and violence. Hartford and activists like him who trained in tactical nonviolence considered it necessary in order to ensure physical safety and still discipline teach demonstrators how to demonstrate and form mutual confidence among demonstrators. For many, the concept of nonviolent protest was a way of life. However, not everyone agreed with this notion. James Foreman, former SNCC and later Black Panther member and nonviolence trainer was among those who did not. In his autobiography, The Making of Black Revolutionaries, Foreman revealed his, pers his perspective on the method of nonviolence is strictly a tactic, not a way of life without limitations. Similarly, Bob Moses, who was also an active member of SNCC, felt that the method of nonviolence was practical. When interviewed by author Robert Penn, Warren Moses said, there is no question that he had a great deal of influence with the masses, but I don't think it's the direction of love. It's in a practical direction. According to a 2020 study in the American Political Science Review, nonviolent civil rights protests boosted vote shares for the Democratic Party in presidential election in nearby counties. But violent protests substantially voted boosted white protests for Republicans in counties near to violent protests. In July 1958, the NAACP Youth Council sponsored sit-ins 
at a lunch counter of a Dockham drugstore in downtown Wichita, Kansas. After three weeks, the movement successfully got the store to change its policy of segregated seating. And soon afterward, all Dockham stores in Kansas were desegregated. This movement was quickly followed in the same year by a student sit-in at a Katz drugstore in Oklahoma City, led by Clara Looper, who was also successful, which was also successful. Mostly black students from area colleges led a sitting at a Woolworth store in Greensboro, North Carolina. On February 1st, 1960, four students, he's L.A. Blair Jr., David Richmond, Joseph McNeil, and Franklin McCain from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College, an all-black college, sat down at the segregated lunch counter to protest Woolworth's policy of excluding African-Americans from being served food there. The four students purchased small items in other parts of the store and kept their receipts and sat down at the lunch counter and asked to be served. After being denied service, they produced the receipts and asked why their money was good everywhere else at the store, but not at the lunch counter. The protesters had been encouraged to dress professionally, to sit quietly, and to occupy every other stool so that potential white sympathizers could join in. Greensboro sit-in was quickly followed by other sit-ins in Richmond, Virginia, Nashville, Tennessee, and Atlanta, Georgia. The most immediately effective of these was in Nashville, where hundreds of well-organized and highly disciplined college students conducted sit-ins in coordination with a boycott campaign. As students across the South began to sit-in at the lunch counters at local, local stores, Police and other officials sometimes used brutal force to physically escort the demonstrators from the lunch counter facilities. The sit-in technique was not new. As far back as 1939, African-American attorney Samuel Wilbur Tucker organized a sit-in at the then segregated Alexandria Virginia Library. In 1960, the technique succeeded in bringing national attention to the movement. On March 9, 1960, an Atlanta University Center group of students released an appeal for human rights as a full page advertisement in newspapers, including the Atlanta Constitution, Atlanta Journal, and Atlanta Daily Word. Known as the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, the group initiated the Atlanta student movement and began to lead sit-ins starting on March 15, 1960. By the end of 1960, the process of sittings and sp had spread to every southern and border state and even to facilities in Nevada, Illinois, and Ohio to discriminate against blacks. Demonstrators focused not only on lunch counters, but also on parks, benches, libraries, theaters, museums, and other public facilities. In April 1960, activists who had led these sit-ins were invited by SCLC activist Ella Baker to hold a conference at Shaw University, a historically black university in Raleigh, North Carolina. This conference led to the formation of the Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. SNCC took these tactics of nonviolent confrontation further and organized the freedom rights. As the Constitution protected interstate commerce, they decided to challenge segregation on interstate, bus, on interstate buses and in public bus facilities by putting interracial teams on them to travel from the north throughout the segregated south. Freedom rides were journeys by civil rights activists on interstate buses into the segregated southern United States to test the United States Supreme Court decision, Boynton versus Virginia, which ruled that segregation was unconstitutional for passengers engaged in interstate travel. During the first and subsequent freedom rides, activists traveled throughout the Deep South to integrate seating patterns 
on buses and desegregate bus terminals, including restrooms and water fountains. That proved to be a dangerous mission. In Anniston, Alabama, one bus was firebombed, forcing its passengers to flee for their lives. In Birmingham, Alabama, an FBI informant reported that Public Safety Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor gave Ku Klux Klan members three 15 minutes to attack an incoming group of Freedom Riders before having police protect them. The Riders were severely beaten until it looked like a bulldog had gotten hold of them. James Peck, a white activist, was beaten so badly that he required 50 stitches to the head. In a similar occurrence in Montgomery, Alabama, the Freedom Riders Following the footsteps of Rosa Parks and rode an integrated Greyhound bus from Birmingham. Although they were protesting interstate bus segregation and peace, they were met with violence in Montgomery as a large white mob attacked them for their activism. They caused an enormous two hour long riot, which resulted in 22 injuries, five of whom were hospitalized. Mob violence in Anniston and Birmingham temporarily halted the riots. SNCC activists from Nashville brought in new riders to continue the journey from Birmingham to New Orleans. In Montgomery, Alabama, at the Greyhound bus station, a mob change, a mob charge another bus led riders known as knocking John Lewis unconscious with a crate and smashing live photography. Don Arbrook in the face with his own camera. A dozen men surrounded James Work. A white student from Fisk University beat, beat and beat him in the face with a suitcase knocking out his teeth. <laughs>